Hello everyone and welcome to Designing Characters, where I explain turning characters from my mind and other media into characters for Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Here, we focus on builds and personality traits, utilizing standard array or point by with D&D Beyond's layout. Today, we're working on Yuji Itadori from the absolutely phenomenal anime Jujutsu Kaisen. I probably butchered that pronunciation, just so everyone's aware. He's a very fresh take on the standard shonen protagonist in that even if he's a bit simple-minded and straightforward, he rapidly attains growth and changes as a teenager in his situation realistically would. Still definitely a shonen protagonist, though, when he just, uh... Need to have my own cursed energy, don't I? Don't do it! So, what makes up our finger-licking-good protagonist? First off, he's absolutely superhuman. Even without the cursed energy, I mean uh, magic and key, UG is a physical powerhouse, throwing lead balls like baseballs, casually yeeting cars out of his way, and outrunning said cars. Adaptive. Yuji has sharp instincts when it comes to learning and sensing danger. He's able to understand basic concepts such as energy control and body movements rapidly to predict, mimic, and learn. Once he understands the basic idea, anyway. Finally, the kid's possessed. Despite his own strength, in the end, what's placed Yuji in this position is the fact that he's made a pact with an ancient, powerful being that grants him a plethora of various other benefits, including not being killed or affected by any toxin at all. First, let's delve into the base ability scores of the character. We'll be using Standard Array for this. If your DM will let you roll, that's fantastic. Just try to keep your highest and lowest stats in this order, and keep in mind multiclassing minimums. First, put your 15 in Dexterity. It's true that your strength is phenomenal, but unfortunately this is an anime. It's D&D, and how hard you hit will be greatly augmented later, don't worry. Your 14 should go into Wisdom. Though you may be a bit impulsive, you're incredibly aware of your surroundings, you get a read on people easily, and you adapt to any situation with surprising ease. Next, your 13 should go into Constitution. I'd like this to be higher because you're a frontline fighter with low hit points, but we'll have to take what we can get. Your 12 in Charisma will represent how likable you are, and the general ability to be half-decent at a few checks that led to your life being saved, and not being killed after eating a single finger. Now, your 10 will go into Strength. I'd really like for this to be higher, you can flip a wagon barehanded after all, but we'll have to use some skills and powers later to help compensate for this a bit. Finally, your 8 will go into intelligence. Yuji isn't really book smart, and a lot of concepts and theories go over his head until they're demonstrated in simple terms. Even then, sometimes he doesn't quite get it. Now, on to race. Uh, Yuji is most assuredly a human, but having the physical power to toss around a car because anime, makes him a pretty solid pick for a variant human as a base. Though if your DM is willing, having him start using the Unearthed Arcana's Hexblood would be a phenomenal option for him as well. But, as a variant human, you gain a plus one to two stats of your choice, you need Charisma for a total of 13, and Dexterity for a total of 16. This will make sense in a moment. But for now you'll get a bonus skill proficiency in language. Nab Perception to represent his ability to detect his surroundings on an inhuman level, as well as Abyssal to represent study into the darker sides of history and religion. Finally, you get a free feat. Take Tough. This allows you an additional two free hit points every level and will help represent that disgustingly high stamina and endurance UG has. Continuing to fight after being stabbed multiple times and losing several fingers isn't something that should be brushed off in D&D, even if it's pretty standard for anime. Now, moving on to background. You were raised in a small monastery of Kelimvor. You are taught equal respect for both the living and the dead. That death is not something to be feared, but embraced when your time has come. This has led to you placing value on others' lives more than your own. You wish to do as much as you can for others to protect them, help them, to save as many people as possible. Your studies in your god and others evolved into a curiosity in the rest of the world. You began to learn of darker subjects, not to follow them, but to understand them. 
This led to you learning languages that involved the darker sides of the occult, alongside a few other students at the monastery. Though their reasons for studying it was less for curiosity and more true interest and desire. Another reason you stuck around with them to help be the voice of reason, to protect them. This background choice is likely obvious. Take Acolyte. This will help you with proficiencies in insight and religion, as well as grant you two languages. Take Undercommon and Deep Speech. When combined with the knowledge of Abyssal, this will give you a solid understanding of the creepy, alien, dark languages that few others know. Finally, this will grant you the Shelter of the Faithful background feature. When visiting other temples and the monasteries that worship Kelimvor, you'll be provided a free modest lifestyle and free healing and aid for you and your party during times of emergency. Your home temple will even heed your calls for aid, though how effective this will be is based on your DM. For general features, there are quite a few options that could work. My recommendations to match Yuji's personality with his background would be things based around charity, helping others, and just general kindness. Those are easy. But for flaws, I'd recommend things based around his obsession with protecting others, his lack of self-care, as well as a pretty large subconscious arrogance that leads to him suffering more damage than necessary. The biggest plot-based point for the character is something coming up due to a multi-class, specifically forming an unwilling pact with an ancient dark being to house its soul in his own body. On that note, we're moving on to class. Your first level will be in Monk. You get a d8 hit die, as well as proficiency in simple weapons, short swords, and your saving throws for strength and dexterity. From here, you've also acquired two additional skill proficiencies and a tool proficiency. Take acrobatics, athletics, and calligraphers tools to represent the years of study in the occult, faith, and just paperwork in general. Your years of training martial arts in the monastery has granted you unarmored defense, allowing you to add your dexterity and wisdom modifiers to your AC, as well as martial arts, which essentially allows you to use your unarmed attacks as if they were finesse melee weapons. This allows you to make a single extra attack using your martial arts if you used your actions for a martial arts attack first. This is where we find Yuji at the start of the show but he rapidly evolves from this point during the first major session, where Yuji, a worshipper of Kelimbor, the one whom hates all undead, makes a calculated risk to finally kill an ancient undead demigod by becoming its new host so that it can be killed with him. As such, at level 2, we're doing an unusual shift in class and taking up Warlock. First level Warlocks get a d8 hit die as well as proficiencies in light armor and simple weapons, which you already have. You now choose your otherworldly patron, which is in this case the Unearthed Arcana's Undead. If your DM doesn't like Unearthed Arcana, then the Fiend or Great Old One could be viable options as well. However, the Undead means you have bound yourself to an ancient and powerful Undead. In this case, it's literally a soul inside you that cannot override your own will. Instead, it grants you some of its powers in return for using you as a host to survive, steadily gaining power by acquiring fragments of its scattered body and absorbing them into your own, also known as eating its fingers. This will grant you an expanded spell list full of various necronic and undead-based spells, as well as the ability to enter your form of dread. This is when the spirit takes your body over and requires a bonus action to activate. It grants you temporary hit points equal to 1d10 plus your warlock level and renders you immune to the frightened condition. As well, every time you hit a creature with an attack, you can force it to make a wisdom saving throw or become frightened of you until the end of your next turn. You can transform a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and you gain all expended uses back when you finish a long rest. This helps show that terrifying presence of the spirit within you as you beat the crap out of them using your martial arts. As a level 1 warlock, you attain several spells through your pact magic. For your cantrips, take Prestidigitation. I swear I pronounce that differently every single time. This is to represent your various minor abilities that having your spirit inside you grants. The spirit forming illusionary mouths across your skin, for instance, or magically cleaning your clothing and altering the colors of what you're wearing when it takes over. Next, take Green Flame Blade and be a warlock without Eldritch Blast. 
for once. Keep in mind, when you use this, it no longer counts as an attack action, even though you are using the weapon. As such, you cannot use martial arts for an extra attack using your bonus action after doing this, but it is useful at later levels to give you some AoE clearing. And views that short sword your new teacher gave you with cursed energy and swing it into the group of tiny cursed spirits trying to eat you and your friends and then nuke them into oblivion. For your level 1 spells, take Hex to make your barrage of unarmed attacks hit a single target far harder, adding a d6 damage to each attack roll that hits them. Along with this, False Life. This grants you an additional 1d4 plus 4 temporary hit points that last for an hour, making it perfect to cast before a battle begins in preparation to represent that inhuman durability you have. Now, at this point, you've gone out of your way to limit the spirit's power as much as possible and focus on training yourself. It's around this point that you awaken knowledge of cursed energy, or, in this case, ki, the energy that flows within all things. Take level 3 in Monk. A level 2 monk gains access to key points, allowing you to do all sorts of enhanced martial arts through burning these key points. This includes Flurry of Blows, allowing you to spend a point to make two unarmed attacks for your bonus action after performing the attack action. It also comes with two other options, including Patient Defense, which allows you to take the dodge action as a bonus action instead, or Step of the Wind, allowing you to take the disengage or dash action as a bonus action while doubling your jump distance for that turn. This also grants you unarmed movement. When not wearing a shield or armor, which you're not wearing anyway, you increase your speed movement by 10 feet. This will increase further as your level grows. This will help show that insane physical ability you possess, and the combined potential with a bit of setup at level 3 using Hex alongside a flurry of blows is absolutely terrifying. At level 4, take your third level in Monk. This grants you Deflect Missiles, allowing you to use your reaction to catch a ranged weapon attack that is fired at you. This reduces the attack's damage by 1d10, plus your dexterity modifier, plus your monk level, which at low levels can reduce an arrow's damage to nothing quite easily. If it does so, this can allow you to spend a key point and throw it at a new target. But the main benefit of this level is gaining the option to choose a monastic tradition. We're going with the way of the Cobalt Soul. If your DM isn't alright with Matt's homebrew, then the Way of the Open Hand is an acceptable replacement for this. Cobot Soul Monks gain the Extract Aspects ability. This allows you to mark any creature you've hit as analyzed, allowing you to learn the target's vulnerabilities, resistances, and immunities. Anytime that a creature you've marked in this way misses you with an attack, you can immediately use your reaction to make an unarmed melee attack against it. A creature is marked until you finish a short or long rest. Use this to represent Yuji's rapidly growing ability to feel key in ways no one else can, allowing him to directly harm the bodies of enemies that normally shrug off damage with ease. At 5th level, take Monk, granting you an ability score or feat. For Monks, your stats are incredibly important, so we're going to take a plus 2 in your dexterity. This also grants you the slow fall ability, allowing you to use your reaction to reduce any damage from a fall by your monk's level multiplied by 5. At 6th level, take monk, granting you access to an extra attack, allowing you to attack twice with your base attack action, amplifying that nasty combo potential with flurry of blows and hex all the more. As well, you acquire the bane to every DM's existence, stunning strike. When you hit another creature with a melee weapon attack, you can spend one key point forcing the target to succeed on a con saving throw or be stunned until the end of your next turn. Now, at level 7, you've absorbed another piece of the spirit, and its power has grown. Concerning, but so too has your own abilities advanced due to this. Take your next level in Warlock. This grants you two Eldritch Invocations. Take Devil Sight and Eldritch Sight, representing your new ability to sense cursed energy on a heightened scale, thus increasing your vision and sixth sense considerably. This allows you to cast Detect Magic at will without expending a spell slot, as well as gaining Dark Vision of 120 feet that can see through magical darkness, thus nullifying the drawbacks of your dumb human eyes. Your new spell should be protection from evil and good, due to your continued studies into being a cursed sorcerer. This allows you to grant protection against aberrations, celestials, elementals, fey, fiends, and undead to a single willing creature you touch, including yourself. These creature types have disadvantage on attack rolls against the target. 
the target also can't be charmed, frightened, or possessed by them. If the target is already charmed, frightened, or possessed by such a creature, the target has advantage on any new saving throws against the relevant effect. Placing this on yourself grants a significant advantage against the cursed creatures you often find yourself hunting in your new profession. Unfortunately, it does not help you against the spirit that has already invaded your body. At level 8, your mastery over your key has reached a new tier with the added cursed power of the spirit growing inside you. Take your next level in Monk. 6th level Cobalt Soul Monks increase their unarmored movement by 15 instead of 10. They also gain the ability to extort truth by punching them hard enough in just the right place, forcing them to make a charisma saving throw, or fail, and be unable to lie for the next 10 minutes. You also gain Key Empowered Strikes, causing your unarmed strikes to become magical for the purpose of overcoming resistances and immunities against non-magical damage. This is to represent your cursed energy, augmenting your strikes, allowing you to hit Zombie Boy despite the fact that normally he doesn't feel any pain or take any damage. Along with this, your studies into the proper magic of a sorcerer has granted you additional skills and knowledge. You gain Mystical Erudition, granting you proficiency in an extra skill and a new language. Take Arcana and Infernal to round out your knowledge of the occult and darkness, along with now dabbling in the knowledge of proper magic. At level 9, take your level in Monk. This grants you Evasion. Anytime you fail a dexterity check, you are able to half the damage you'd normally take. And if you succeed, then you take no damage at all. As well, you obtain Stillness of Mind, allowing you to use your action to end either the charmed or frightened effects on your mind. Yuji doesn't fall back and act afraid very often, and between this and your form of dread, the chances of you suffering any long-term mental effects is next to nothing. Finally, your training has begun to properly come to fruition. As your skill in martial arts grows, granting you your next level in Monk at level 10. At this point, you gain another ability score improvement. Another plus 2 to your dexterity, capping out at 20 now for a healthy AC and bonuses to your attacks and damage. At level 11, you've managed to acquire another portion of the spirit's power, and you gain an additional level in Warlock. Level 3 Warlocks choose a Pact Boon. For you, choose the Pact of the Blade. Though you start relying on your fists more, being able to summon a cursed blade at will is hardly useless. As well, your next spell becomes an option. Take Armor of Agathus. Flavor it is cursed energy condensing along the body in blood and dark undead energy. Maybe talk to your DM about altering the damage type to necrotic instead to represent the undead pact. With the amplification of the new part of your spirit's power, your own power continues to grow grant you another level in Warlock at level 12. Fourth level Warlocks gain an extra ability score improvement. For this, use it to round off your uneven stats and take a plus one constitution and plus one charisma, representing the energy of your spirit, amplifying your own powers and body. For your new spell, take Mirror Image to replicate those anime super fast movements. This allows you to create three clones and force enemies with vision to risk cutting down the illusions instead of the user every time they attack them, making you that much more difficult to hit and harm. Now, at level 13, we'll bounce back to Monk. Level 9 Monks gain another enhanced unarmored movement, gaining the ability to move along vertical surfaces and across liquids on your turn without falling during your movement, allowing you to perform those ridiculous anime feats of dashing across water, running along walls, and up buildings. At level 14, take another level in Monk. 10th level Monks gain Purity of Body. This represents the fact your spirit possessing you grants you resistance and your immunity to sickness and disease, granting you immunity to poison and disease. Your unarmored movement is also enhanced, granting you 20 extra speed instead of 15. At level 15, take another Monk level. 11th level Cobalt Soul Monks gain Minds of Mercury allowing you to burn a key point to take an additional reaction. This has no notable cap aside how many reactions you can perform and how many key points you have, so it's excellent for controlling a combat situation through action economy to pummel them even when it's not your turn. When paired with all your on-hit bonus damage and effects, this can be pretty daunting. You also gain an additional mystical erudition, allowing you to acquire proficiency in investigation, with your continued work and studies as a spirit sorcerer, along with knowledge of Celestial, beginning to branch out into other aspects of the occult now that you've delved so deeply into the darkness. Level 16 will also be Monk, and level 12 Monks gain another ability score improvement. This grants you an additional plus 2 to Wisdom to help your key DC and other Monk abilities. Now, level 17. 
you'll take another level in Monk. Level 13 monks gain the Tongue of Sun and Moon feature, allowing you to communicate with anything and causing it to understand what you say, and you understand all spoken languages as well. Note this does not work on reading languages, though, which is why spells like Comprehend Language and actually knowing the languages that you do still comes in handy. Finally, at level 18, you gain your final level in Monk. Level 14 monks gain further enhanced movement, granting them 25 bonus speed instead of 20. This also caps off your unarmed strike set, 1d8 damage base. But the largest benefit is gaining the Diamond Soul feature, an ability that causes you to become proficient in, in all saving throws. Additionally, when you fail a saving throw, you can spend a key point to reroll it and take the second reroll. Now, as your own powers have grown, so too has the power of the spirit's fragments inside of you. The being within your soul grows, and at level 19, you'll take a warlock level. Level 5 warlocks gain an additional Eldritch Invocation. Take Eldritch Smite, allowing you to use the Black Flash with your packed weapon, infusing deep black and red energy into the blow to apply devastating power to it. When you hit a target with an attack using your Pact Weapon, you can expend a Warlock spell slot to add an additional 1d8 force damage to the attack, with an additional 1d8 force damage per level of the spell slot. This also knocks the target prone if they are huge or small. Talk to your DM about allowing you to do this while unarmed, and it's the perfect Black Flash since the damage will now be practically the same. If they refuse, then it's a close second to Black Flash at least. For your spell, take Counterspell representing your spirit's ability to simply shut down the domain expansions of others on a whim, as well as their own cursed arts. I mean magic. You also gain an additional cantrip. As such, take Minor Illusion, representing more of the basic abilities of your spirit, allowing you to create a sound or a visual illusion within a 5-foot cube. Finally, our level 20 capstone is another final level in Warlock. Level 6 Undead Warlocks gain the passive trait of Grave Touched. You no longer need to eat, drink, or breathe to survive. The trait I would like when trying to speak on these scripts. But this is playing on that near-inhuman body that Yuji now holds. But the biggest benefit of this is the power, as this causes any attack the user deals to change to necrotic damage at their will, when in their form of dread. They are able to augment this even further. In this state, you are able to roll an additional damage die per hit of necrotic damage the target takes. This has officially upgraded the power of your strikes when you allow the spirit to take over to become absolutely devastating against other opponents. Now that we're level 20, how does this build fare? For strengths, you have an abundance of offensive potential. Between the use of constant fear effects for no key point investment alongside 2d8 damage per hit, even without the use of key to augment yourself even further, or using any spell slots, you are an amazing controller and consistent damage dealer. Since your form of dread has 6 slots at this point, you're able to casually use it in almost every fight. Atop this, if you do want to use your key points or your warlock smites, your damage potential skyrockets. With burst damage through your warlock smites, consistent slow burning damage using hex, and burning key points to attack four or more times every turn, you can deal quite a bit of damage pretty quickly, all while maintaining pretty solid base damage per round. Not only do you deal out the fear condition per hit, but you're also immune to basically every condition used in the game. Between your monk abilities and your form of dread, fear, charmed, poison, and disease have no effect on you at all. Combine this with not needing to breathe and directly rendering you immune to a plethora of environmental effects, and you're a pain to deal with. Your spells also allow you a bit of versatility to switch from burst damage to become a tank instead. Between your form of dread feature and armor of Agathis with false life, your temporary hit points will almost always be at least 10, and more often you'll be hitting 15 to 20, and Armor of Agathis also doubles as a damage dealer for those that hit you. Finally, your other spells and Eldritch invocations offer some decent utility outside of combat to detect magic, have a solid perception, and long-range dark vision. The ability to see through magical darkness and having the option of a half-decent counterspell if the need really arises gives you a decent amount of utility. Now, for weaknesses. First, your skills are severely lacking. 
The skills you're good at are weakened by your horrendous intelligence score. The skills you could be decent at with your charisma have no bonus from proficiency. So, unless it's a physical skill or your perception abilities, you're not really going to be helping out in the roleplay skill checks for the party. Second, your intelligence score is horrible meaning that big bads that are spellcasters may get tired of you being immune to practically everything and just feeble-minding you into oblivion. Your monk proficiency bonus helps a bit, but it's only a plus 5, and that's only at level 18. Before that point, you're in some serious trouble. Third, your spells are lacking. The few you have are basically entirely focused on combat aside from detect magic for a bit of utility outside of it, but that's not it much, and you don't really have anything else. Finally, you have a high reliance on necrotic damage and key points. 14 points may seem like a lot, but I assure you, at high level combat, it really isn't. Your form of dread helps a bit, allowing you to not need them as much with consistent damage per hit, but even that only lasts until you run into a monster with resistance to necrotic damage, and suddenly you're in pretty deep trouble. But that's not what your focus is on. Don't let the spirit have its way just because it makes you stronger. Ignore its whispers to use its power, and use your own if you're against someone that resists that necrotic damage damage. Stand firm. Your willpower is why you were able to absorb the spirit to begin with. Protect those dear to you. Be mobile. Attract attention to be the main threat that others target. Your specialty is combat. Rely on others to make up for your weaknesses in social and tactical situations. Become a shield and a sword to protect those that you care for. And one day, die to protect the world in Kellum Vor's name. As always, thanks for watching. If you like the video, please subscribe for more, ring the bell, all that good YouTuber stuff. I do videos on all kinds of Dungeons and Dragons, storytelling, let's plays, and various nerd things once to twice a week. If you're interested in my own world, I'd encourage you to check out my Wattpad, which has my first book being released in a per chapter basis, as well as my Discord, where I run a literate roleplay board and expand the world using World Anvil. I'd like to thank my Platinum patrons, Crom and SPS. Your donations mean the world to me. If you'd like to become a patron to help fund my books, board, or channel, please drop by the link to my Patreon in the description below. Let me know what character build or video you'd like to see next in the comments below. I read them all and reply to as many as I can. I hope you all have an amazing day. Be safe. Love each other. Goodbye.